Hello and welcome to my talk about estimating the distortion component of hearing impairment from attenuation-based model predictions using machine learning. When you're sitting in a restaurant and talk with your friends and family, you typically do not have any problems at all to understand them, so you can socially interact with them. People with hearing impairment face a more difficult challenge since they do not understand everything that is being said, so they cannot socially interact with the others. If we now use a model to predict how a normal hearing person is understanding the speech, we can also use the same model and make it hearing impaired to simulate what the hearing impaired person is understanding in order to figure out what might impair in the people and why it is that they do not understand speech as good as normal hearing listeners. The test that we are using to figure this out is the so-called matrix sentence test, or at least the German version of it. It always consists of five words. For the German version, that is the name, verb, number, adjective, and noun, which can be combined into nonsense sentences like Peter gets four green knives. And with this test, we can measure the so-called speech recognition threshold, the SRT, which is the signal level or signal to noise ratio with a 50% word recognition performance. This test is available in more than 20 different languages, for example, German, Swedish, or Japanese. Back in 1978, Plomp developed the concept of the attenuation and the distortion component. If you depict the SRT in dBSPL on the y-axis across the noise level in dBSPL on the x-axis, you can see this pattern here. The dashed line indicates an SNR of 0 dB. People with normal hearing have no problem to understand speech in calm environments, although their normal hearing absolute threshold defines their listening performance there. But as the noise level increases, then the SRT is defined by the noise level. The same holds true for people with an A component of hearing impairment, so an increased absolute hearing threshold, which limits their ability to understand speech in calm environment, but they can get as good as normal hearing listeners in noisy environments. People who suffer from a distortion component of hearing impairment have a more difficult task since they have more difficulties to understand speech in quiet, and they also have more difficulties to understand speech in noisy environments. What we did to estimate the D component was that we took SRTs measured in a stationary noise, which was presented 65 dB SPL, from 315 years. So in this plot, we were around here. If you now depict the hearing threshold across the frequency, we had three different groups. Group A, who had the better audiograms, so normal hearing to slight moderate hearing impaired, and group B with moderate to severely impaired hearing uh, uh, listeners. Group E consisted of special cases with deeply sobbing hearing losses, so they were close to normal hearing for low frequencies and, well, rather deaf for frequencies of, well, up to, uh, from 2 kHz upwards. If you depict the SRT here on the y-axis across the average hearing loss for 0 0.5, 1, 2, and 4 kHz, we can see these patterns emerging. People with the better audiograms performed the task in noise so they could hear the noise, although their SRTs also increased with the average hearing loss, which cannot be due to um, the masker since they heard the masker, so it must be due to something else. People of group B performed worse, so their listening performance or their SRTs were defined by their absolute hearing threshold, so they performed the task rather than quiet. And then there was group E, who was well in between that. For low frequencies, they could definitely hear the noise, but at high frequencies, they could not hear the noise. So they are out of the scope for these two patterns. Our model assumption was that if we just use the absolute hearing threshold for the simulations, then the prediction error of the SRTs reflects, to some extent, the D component. To examine this, we looked at three different models, namely the Speech Intelligibility Index, the SII, a modified version of it, termed PUF, uh, since it was inspired by the work of Pavlovich et al. from 1986, and uh, the Framework for Auditory Discrimination Experiments on Short Fate. The SII works as follows. We take the speech, noise, the audiogram, and calculate the speech spectrum level from uh, speech and from noise and audiogram some kind of disturbance spectrum level. These two are weighted against each other 
then sums uh, to uh, determine an index value which has to be mapped to an SRT. The modification of path was uh, just to use the autogram to weight the frequency weighting, which we did, but we also normalized the frequency weighting afterwards. After that, uh, it was uh, frequently the output was weighted again to determine some kind of index value, which was mapped to an SRT. Fate was inspired by automatic speech recognition systems and works as follows. First, you take speech signals and a noise and mix them together at different signal to noise ratios. These mixtures can then be processed with some kind of hearing aid algorithm, although this was not done in this work, and after that, features are extracted. These were based on a so-called log mail spectrogram, so spectrotemporal representation of the signal, which can also be modified to include hearing impairment. After that, features were extracted from the log mail spectrogram, which are sensitive to spectrotemporal modulations. These features were used to train an automatic speech recognition system, which was based on a hidden Markov model with Gaussian mixture models, and the same signals with different excerpts of the noise were used to test the ASR systems. After that, the performance was evaluated by the means of psychometric function. So here you can see the recognition rate depicted across the signal to noise ratio. And we find the SRT, so where 50% of the words are understood, at about minus 90 dB for this example. If you now depict the prediction errors here on the y axis across the average hearing loss, so our estimated distortion component, you can see this pattern for the SRI. So for low average hearing losses, the SRI performs good, well, which is as expected. For slightly higher hearing losses, the SRT performs too good, so it predicts too low SRTs, but um, as the average hearing losses increases, the predictions get worse, so higher SRTs are predicted higher than already measured, which indicates that the SRI already considers too much in its prediction, such that more impairment in the form of some kind of distortion component could not improve the predictions, but only make it worse, since adding more hearing impairment will actually make the SRTs worse, and therefore the SRI is already, well, not modifiable anymore, to consider this D component in its prediction. And that means that this is actually no valid prediction or estimation of the distortion component. This pattern looks very much different uh, for Pavlovich modification, since Puff always uh, predicts too low SRT, so it's always better than the measured data. But also um, these data increase linearly. So what I did, I used this blue data points to fit a linear function to, and this linear function describes all the different SRTs that were measured here, especially for the steeply sloping group um, here depicted in red. This means that the A component was accurately considered. The same pattern was found uh, with fate, so linearly increasing um, prediction errors for them since the model misses something, as well as Puff misses something, some kind of form of hearing impairment, to make accurate predictions. And since these prediction errors remain for both models, which were completely different, but accurately take into account the um, yeah, uh, co uh, contribution of the different frequency bands to speech recognition thresholds, that seems that these prediction errors indicate the D component. The nice thing about fate is, however, that it also extends to other conditions like speech and fluctuating maskers and also to psychoacoustic tasks like the simulation of tone and noise detection experiments or also to binaural tasks. So this approach is applicable to many different well, problems that we might um, want to predict or to simulate. Another nice thing is that these approaches directly support diagnostics in a general and in an individual sense. General by just measuring the audiogram and seeing whether well, the person has some kind of hearing, average hearing loss of 90 dBHL. So most likely that D component is in the range of uh, 10 dB. It can also be used on an individual level by making an individual prediction and looking at the difference between the attenuation component based prediction and the actual measurement and regarding that as a D component estimate. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. 
and I'm looking very much for having a nice discussion with you. Thank you.